Okay. Well, let's pray first. Father, I, I ask you, I'm going to have a Bible study at this time, and Lord, we want to give a thought to what you say in your word about different things. Father, I pray that, that the word would indeed be a lamp unto our feet. Lord, we need light. You've given, you've given us your word to help us through this life, to give us direction, to give us instruction, to, to help us to know your mind, to help us to know what the will of God is, what's pleasing to you. Lord, I pray that I pray that the Spirit of God would allow this word to, to resonate with us, to open our eyes to things. We pray that you give us ears to hear what the Spirit says in these inspired words. I pray that you'd be a help to us tonight. Please, in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Okay. So... I'm not going to I'm not going to work in exact order that I have them this time but I will try to cover everything eventually that at least that I have right now um Sam sent me one from anonymous and here's a question and I think I think this is a good one to to look at because I th I think that there's just some good all round principles for our Christian lives to be found in this question. Is smoking a sin? Or more precisely, is smoking cigarettes, smoking cigars, smoking electronic cigarettes, that vaping thing, is it a sin? And so I thought, I thought maybe that'd be a good one to start with for us just to give consideration to. You know, I, I guess, I, I guess for starters, I know that oftentimes we like to ask questions like that. Is, is drinking sin? Is smoking sin? Is dancing sin? I mean, you can, you can keep going. Is owning a Mercedes Benz sin? Is, is uh, you know, visit, is, is going to a concert sin? If it's, if it's hip hop, yes. If it's classical, no. You know, who, who makes the rules? And, and so there's all sorts of things like this that we have to, we have to wrestle with because it's a practical question. We have to ask practical questions like this all the time. We have to be running what we do through the filter of, does God approve of what I'm doing? I mean, if I'm really mindful to live my life before him in a way that pleases him, then I should be asking questions about everything that I allow into my life. And so, okay. Is smoking sin? Well, the Bible doesn't say so. And in fact, let's, let's just look at something that our Bibles say. Look with me at 1 Timothy. First Timothy. In chapter 4, probably a lot of you are familiar with this. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, now we're in the later times, some will depart from the faith, 
by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits. So you have people who are leaving Orthodox Christianity. They're falling prey to demons, deceitful spirits, teachings of demons. It's not just the demons, it's their teachings. Through the insincerity of liars. So, I mean, these, these spirits are deceitful. And so when people follow their deceitful teachings, they themselves become liars because they're not speaking the truth. They're not properly representing God. They're lying about God. Their consciences are seared. Now notice this. They forbid marriage. That reminds you of the Catholic Church. And require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Now notice this, everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it's made holy by the word of God and prayer. I know, technically speaking, you could say, well, that's speaking about food and marriage. That's speaking, obviously, about marriage and sexual intimacy that's had in the marriage, because that's one of the issues. It's the celibacy thing. It's not exactly talking about cigarettes. Okay, I'll grant you that. But it is interesting that it talks about everything created by God is good. Now, I know you could say, well, you know, how far do you take that? I mean, God... God made what's found in heroin, and God made what's found in cocaine, and God made what's, yes, I recognize. Where, where do you draw the line? Well, what's interesting is this. It's demonic. It's, it's, there is a demonic tendency to basically just make rules. That is a demonic tendency to basically try to define religion or define Christian morals is just a checklist, which typically ends up being, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. It's like our spirituality gets absorbed and obsessed with this kind of thing. It's it's just not the way scripture tends to approach us. Let me ask you this. Do you know anybody that you would consider to be a godly man or woman who has smoked cigarettes or cigars? Spurgeon. Okay, Spurgeon is a classic example. You gotta love Spurgeon. He said, some people, some people pull their weeds, I smoke mine. Um, and, and I know that people People get all bent out of shape about Spurgeon. Some people, they swear up and down. Well, he quit smoking them. He did it one, quite honestly, I've actually found the opposite. I, I don't believe I have found that he did ever quit. But there are some men that I know of that did quit. Anybody know somebody else? Somebody that smoked cigarettes and then quit? Martin Lloyd Jones. In fact, I have specifically read where Lloyd-Jones talks about when he came to the place where he quit. He didn't quit because he suddenly found the verse in the Bible that said, thou shall not smoke cigarettes. Does anybody know what he, anybody know about the story? You know what happened? He ran out of cigarettes. One day, he had different places he kept cigarettes, like different little cubby holes and pockets of jackets and different things. And you know what happened? One day, he went and he looked at his pack of cigarettes, and it was empty. And he started looking in his cubby holes, and he started looking in his coat pockets, and he couldn't find any. And he was getting somewhat bent out of shape and frantic. And can you ima- can anybody imagine what verse might have come to his mind? 
probably something about um, dominion, like having let nothing have dominion over you. Yes. In fact, let's let's look because you get some of these verses. There, there's two places where you get better, very similar text. One is First Corinthians chapter six. Let's go there. First Corinthians six. So, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything brought under the power of anything. Now, when, he, when Paul says all things are lawful for me, he's quoting what somebody else said. And he's basically saying, well, okay, yes. I mean, in the realm of gray area, we know that there are certain things God forbids. Paul's not saying that sexual immorality is lawful for me. He's not saying that. He's, he's acknowledging a saying that the Corinthians threw at him, and he's saying, yeah, yeah, basically. I mean, if God doesn't forbid things, it may be lawful, it may be allowable, but so you see, the issue isn't a checklist. It never is. The issue is we have to think more deeply. God wants us to walk in the spirit. That's, that's Galatians 5. Walk in the spirit. We need to be people of scripture. We need to be people who want to please the Lord. And we're not, we're not to walk before the Lord with a rigid checklist. We, got, we have, you know what, people that do that are very shallow. That is a very shallow approach. We want to ask deeper questions, not just is it right or wrong. There's, there's something very, uh, very immature about that approach to, to walking before the Lord. We want to ask deeper questions. We want to ask questions like this. Is it helpful? Not just is it lawful. Is it helpful? Does it bring me into bondage? Okay, there's a similar text over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Look over there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. Again, he starts out basically, you'll see if you've got the ESV, there's quotation marks around this. It means what he's doing is quoting what the Corinthians wrote to him about, which obviously the translators are assuming that, but I think it's a good assumption. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Now that's the same thing he said back in chapter six, but now he's gonna give us a new, all things are lawful, but not all things build up. So, Here's, here's the thing. Spurgeon, I read where Spurgeon said, I've got his autobiography. Spurgeon said that when he, he was under extreme pressure, anybody that's been in the pastor, pastorate, um, the ministry brings really tremendous spiritual struggles. Many of you may know that Spurgeon struggled, immensely struggled with depression. He said that when he would come home at the end of a long day and sit down and smoke a cigar, he said it was relaxing to him. And he said he could do it to the praise of God. 
Now, look, you're right here in 1 Corinthians 10. Go down a little way. Go down to verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do you know Spurgeon was absolutely convinced that he could light up that cigar and it was relaxing to him and that it was one of the things in a life of, of lots of work, lots, I mean, Spurgeon poured himself out 18 hours a day. And if he had these little windows of rest and relaxation when he could light up the cigar and he could praise the Lord for it and do it to the glory of God, I do not believe it was sin. In fact, I believe that if he had the ability to glorify God in it, God was smiling at him when he smoked it. Now, Lloyd-Jones got to the place where he recognized, I'm in bondage. He didn't like the fact that when he ran out of cigarettes, he found himself controlled by them. And that verse in 1 Corinthians 6, it convinced him, I'm being controlled by nicotine, by tobacco, and I shouldn't be. And he quit. He quit, on, I, from what I understand, he quit on the spot, never smoked again. Uh, some of you may know that R.C. Sproul used to smoke. Of course, if you saw R.C. before he died, you also saw that he was on oxygen. He had the tubes hanging off of his face. And, you know, when, when you smoke, are there, are there potential health issues? Well, yes. But listen, if health issue alone is a factor, you shouldn't eat any processed food. You shouldn't drink any water that comes from Manchester City that's got chlorine and fluorine in it. I mean, look, if, if we're interested in that which isn't best for our health, you probably want to stay out of the sun. It causes cancer. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you could say, well, you shouldn't do it. I would say in the end, the reality is this. We need to apply texts like this, that where we're asking these kind of questions, whatever I do, can I do to the glory of God? Can I, can I do this and not be brought under the power of it? Can I do it and it's going to be helpful? Can I do it and it's going to build me up? And then another thing to think about is, is Romans 14. Let's look at Romans 14. This will be the last text we'll look at. But Romans 14 is helpful because, again, it's this, Romans 14 is all about this, this, these areas of our lives where we're trying to figure out if we should observe a day or if we should eat meat or not. It's, we're trying to figure out these gray areas of life. And you know what? Paul says here, he says that, you know, you get one person that esteems a day and one person doesn't esteem the day. This is what I was talking about concerning Christmas. Some people observe it, some people don't. Some people observe birthdays, some people don't. But here's, a, here's the real point. Romans 14, 6. Kind of like we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where it says, whatever you do, do to the glory of God. Well, that's the point here. If you observe the day, what's really important is that you honor the Lord. If, you, if you're going to eat, honor the Lord. And you give thanks to God. That honors him. If you, could, if, you can, if you can do that unto the Lord, and you can do it for the glory of God, and you could give thanks to him, and you can do it joyfully, and you feel freedom, and you're at peace. Do it unto the Lord. More power to you. But here's the thing. When you go down to verse 23, it says, whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. 
For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Okay, you want to know something that's specifically sin? If you can't do it by faith. In other words, if you do something that you believe is wrong, it's sin. Listen, that's where Lloyd-Jones got to. Lloyd-Jones said, I should not be brought under the power of anything. And he quit. Brethren, I didn't drink coffee for 16 years. And I'm not saying everybody needs to be bound by that at all. I'm just saying I felt at a certain time in my life that I, th I thought I liked coffee too much. And so I, I said, Lord, I'll give it up for the rest of my life if that's what you want me to do. And I laid a fleece out there. I said, Lord, if you do, if you do a certain thing, it'll, it'll be a sign to me that it's okay to drink it again. And 16 years later, it happened. But I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm just saying we all have to walk before the Lord with a clear conscience. We need to have faith that what we're doing is good before the Lord. And we need to have an idea that we can do it to the honor of the Lord and to the glory of God. And if there's a question, if we doubt, we shouldn't do it. That's what's being said there. If you doubt, it's no good. You're condemned if you eat. You're condemned in your conscience. If you can't do something from faith, that means believing it's right, then you shouldn't do it. Because look, if you believe something's wrong and you go do it, what is that, what is that saying? It says you're in rebellion against God. What it says is you believe that God doesn't approve of it, and yet you go do it anyway. That's why it's sin. See, sin is transgression of God's law. And when you do something that you think God doesn't approve of, and you go do it anyway, you see it's disrespect of him. It's, so you should always follow your conscience. Now, it's important that we have consciences that are biblically trained and biblically enlightened. And so, you know, it can be very easy to, to fall prey to another man's conscience. Somebody else feels strongly about something, and so you feel bound by that man's conscience. But you don't want to be there. You want your conscience bound to the Word of God. That's where you want it. We need to be free men and women, not bound by other men's consciences. Paul, Paul speaks about that. We don't want to be bound by other men's. That's what Romans 14 is all about. Somebody else can differ with me, and I can still do what I do to the honor and glory of the Lord, even though somebody else strongly is convinced that they shouldn't do it. Just because... But, and, and you know what you don't want to do? You don't want to condemn each other. That's the point of Romans 14. Because what can happen is, I'm sure there are some among you who feel like, like alcohol. No Christian should drink alcohol. You know, if you listen to John Piper and John MacArthur, they strongly believe that Christians should not do it. Now, Piper's got a little different. Piper believes it's permissible, he, just not advisable. MacArthur doesn't believe it's, he doesn't believe it's permissible. And he doesn't do it. And Piper doesn't do it. And you see, we can get to where we allow those men's consciences to, to rule us. I mean, we don't want to be in that place. We want the word of God to do that. Um, you know, somebody, there are probably people on the screen here or listening that feel very strongly about smoking cigarettes. You know, there, there are certain, they have a Spurgeon Society in the United States made up of Reformed Baptists. And these guys get together and they drink wine and they smoke cigars and pipes. <clears throat> uh, I, I mean, there are those who, who, recoil at that. Their hair probably stands on end. 
But I would just say this. Romans 14 says, we stand or fall before the Lord. We're not in a place to judge each other. We each stand or fall before Christ. It says, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Why do you despise your brother? We all are going to stand before the judgment seat of God. That's the issue. We stand before him. And we've got to give an account to him. And so that's the issue. We each want to have a clear conscience before the Lord. So we don't want to be rigid and make these rules. But I would say this. If, if I find a professing Christian who asks me, is it sin to smoke? You know, one of the questions I'm going to ask him is, do you think it is? If he says to me, no, I don't think it is, and he does it, and he can do it to the glory of God, okay. The big problem is this. Most professing Christians I've ever had to ask me about smoking, when I ask them, do you think it's sin? They say, yes, they do. And yet they still do it. Now that's bad. Because what they're doing is they're doing what they believe God does not approve of. You see what that is? That's, that's a person who's despising what they believe God wants from them. True disciples, Jesus said, you have a wise man and a foolish man. And the wise man, he builds his house on the rock. He's the one that hears and he does. A person who goes against what God says, that's the hallmark of a lost person. People who knowingly continue in sin, that's, that's a bad sign. That's really bad. And so, brethren, we don't want to violate our conscience. We want to enlighten, enlighten, enlighten. But, but we want to be people. Paul, the, the Apostle Paul, he was diligent to try to have a clear conscience before God and men. We really need to be diligent to do just the same. So don't bi violate your conscience, brethren. <clears throat> and you know, do you know, sometimes when it comes to violating our conscience and doing what we think to be right, it, that can change. Clearly, if we've got a realm where one Christian can do a thing and he can do it to the honor of the Lord and another person not do the thing, and not do it under the honor and glory of the Lord. Clearly, there are things in life that during one season of my life I may not do, and another season of my life I feel the liberty to do. So we don't want to be rigid. We just we want to be biblical and we want to live before the Lord. We don't want to live before a list of rules, a list of do's and don'ts. We want to be people that commune with the Lord and live before the Lord. That's really key to the way we live our lives and walk as Christians. We want to constantly be talking with him, asking him, inquiring of him what he delights in and approves of. And you know what? If, if you have a hard day at work and you can go home and you can light up a cigar and you just feel joy inexpressible, and you feel like God has given it to you, and you know what? <laughs> that person delights, delighting in the Lord like that is more honoring to God than the prude who, with wrinkled face, you know, they're all sour, and they just forbid everything, and they're upset about anybody that, that exercises any Christian liberty. Um, that person certainly isn't, 
is it most glorifying to the Lord? Can I, can I add a different dynamic to, to, to it? So um, what about if it's, um, if, well, I mean, like a lot of things, but what about if smoking is affecting our loved ones? Like, you know, you got this Christian man and a, and a Christian woman, and he, he has the liberty to smoke a, a cigar, right? Okay. And, but his wife is like, doesn't, doesn't think it's right, doesn't think it's good. Like, would it, would it be best for him to say, well, well, for the sake of love, for the sake of not making my wife stumble or any other people stumble, I'm not going to smoke. Like, where, you know what I mean? What about in the context of actual a family, which is, which does happen, you know, like when. Well, the true sense in which we cause or might cause somebody to stumble is if my smoking it is going to lead my wife to smoking it. So <clears throat> now, now look, there is, a, there is the question of love. And there's the, uh, there's the question of how does what I do affect others? You see, that's a big question in like whether you eat meat offered to idols or not eat it. It's how it affects others. Paul says, I won't drink wine. I won't eat meat if it's going to cause my brother to stumble. Now, stumble isn't just that oh, they're offended that I'm enjoying my Christian liberty. That's not what stumble means. Stumble means that they might trip and fall into sin. I might cause them to defile their own conscience. That's one thing to think about. But look, if you have a wife and she's like pleading with you, honey, please don't smoke those things. I don't want your life cut short. I don't want to be a widow when I'm 40 years old. Or you know, that gives me a migraine. <laughs> well, I mean, if, if you have to, if your wife approves of it and you have to go out in the middle of a field to smoke it so that you don't contaminate the children, I mean, look, there are definitely health issues that we're aware of today that Spurgeon probably was not aware of and even Martin Lloyd-Jones was probably not aware of. Of course, Lloyd-Jones got cancer. And uh, could it have been related? It definitely could have been related. I mean, cancer and cigarette smoking or, or uh, cigar smoking is, is it, we know a lot more now. So um, I, I'll just say this. I'm not a fan of smoking. I, if I see a professing Christian who smokes, or choose tobacco, I am not going to launch out on a tirade on them and tell them, God forbids that, because that would be a lie. That would be more in the spirit of these demonic teachings. But, you know, it's, there's a lot of things to consider. Our testimony, our health, the health of those around us, like, can I, can I, like you just said your t testimony there so like that's another thing too because like in the UK like generally speaking like if if you went to a workplace in the UK and and and, and they knew you they, you came and you, you said that you were Christian and that name you go to a church and whatnot and your life is you, you know you you want to live for the Lord but then you they saw you outside the workplace underneath the shelter smoking a couple of rollies, they would be like, they would, the first thing they'd probably say is, oh, I thought you were a Christian. Or, um, is that, is that okay to do like as a Christian? Like, I mean, automatically, like people would think that you're, you're acting a bit like a hypocrite. Yeah. That, that's, that's generally like what people would feel like. No, like, we do, we do have to give attention to the culture we're in. Listen, listen, if the culture we're in basically believes, it's, it's pretty much the same down in the Bible Belt of Southern United States. If, if you smoke, that is, that is generally considered 
to not be Christian conduct. And, and that's, why would you want to destroy your testimony? I, 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 yeah, you don't want to. And I think, I, think it, I think we have to be careful in anything that we allow. We, see, what Paul wants us to do is think beyond the checklist. He wants us asking questions. Is this going to build me up? Is this going to build others up? Is this going to bring me under, under its power, slavery, dominion? Is this, does this edify? Does this help somehow? Is this ever going to cause somebody else to stumble? You see, there's a much bigger picture. And I'll tell you, people who don't think that way, they're just selfish, and they just want to do what they want to do without ever considering how it affects other people, that is totally not the spirit that Paul operated in. And so, yes, we want to think all the time. How does this impact my children? How does this impact? I have to, I mean, Ruby and I were just talking. We know this full well. You all are watching us. How we respond to things like the lockdown here in Manchester. How we do things with our lives, what we allow, what we don't allow. We recognize people are watching. And you know what? You as Christians, people are watching. People in, in family, people in society, people neighbors are watching. People are constantly watching. And so we need to live in light of that reality. No question. Can, can, I, can I just add, add one more thing? And, and that's like, obviously, you've got some people that, they, like, once again, they live in areas or they've got a background history. They've had friendship they've been in circles friendships with people who are just you know they, they are they are slaves to 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 smoking and drinking and and for them smoking and drinking just goes hand in hand um so like say say a person gets saved um in in that type of circle should they would they maybe consider oh but wait a minute you know like i'm trying to be an example of christ yeah that these things on the, the the ultimate you know these these things should should not control my life and should they kind of a person like that should they make extra effort be like i want to be like i want to have such a not nothing to do with cigarettes and smoking that i might be a light to these people to those who are enslaved to it have you ever heard bob jennings testimony about the guy that he went to college with yeah yeah i have yeah when, yeah. For those of you that don't know it, Bob had a friend when he was lost that he used to party with and drink with and, I don't know, do everything that lost Bob Jennings did with his friends. And then Bob gets saved. And Bob goes and looks this guy up. He, he goes to the guy's house and his wife is there. And the wife says, oh, well, he's probably over at the, some tavern somewhere some pool hall, or I forget what it was. And so Bob went over there looking for his friend because he wanted to preach the gospel to this guy. And the guy, he was there. And the guy started asking Bob to have a drink with him. And Bob said, no, he didn't do that anymore. And the guy kept pressing him, pressing him, pressing him. And eventually Bob caved in. And the moment he took a sip from that drink, the guy said, I knew it. And it's like, I got you. Like, you're not real. And see, it's, yes. I mean, I think, I think that there's something to that, that we want to be very careful how we live in front of the watching world. That's what you see, Paul. Paul was very concerned about how his actions affected other people. And we need to do that. Like I say, brethren, people who don't consider how their own actions affect other people, that is just selfish. That is, that is not the spirit of Christianity that we find in the New Testament. Can I ask? Yeah. Can I ask something? Oh, sorry. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, can I ask something? It's Natasha's mum. I just wanted to ask on behalf of my friend, uh, her name is Dorette, and she, she's saved and she loves the Lord, 
um, and she was trying to come off. She she had already come off the smokes, but she's on the e-cigarettes now. But she's still feeling kind of like kind of like she's condemned or so. I've been praying with her and so on, saying that she isn't. She loves the Lord and everything. She goes to his house. She reads her Bible. What do I say to her or how can I help pray with her? Well, Ingrid, one of the things, one of the things we want to, we want to be careful. I'll, I'll tell you this. Somebody who feels condemned because they feel like God doesn't want them to do something. A person who feels like something in their life is wrong, but they're brought under the power of it and they just simply keep doing it. They can say, well, I love the Lord. See, that can be like this automatic assumption. Well, they love the Lord. They go to church and they read their Bible. See, they love the Lord. And yet, if a person tells me, well, here's somebody, they know something's wrong. In other words, they know God doesn't approve of something, and yet they keep doing it anyway. You see, that actually, that actually is a lifestyle that's saying, I don't love God. And so I'll tell you what scripture says. Scripture says, Stop it. Scripture, I mean, if, if you think about how Scripture talks, it says, let the thief stop stealing. What? Immediately? Right now? Just quit? Yes, that's what it says. It says, put off the old man. It's, we have, we have basically instruction in Scripture to do right, right now to stop the wrong immediately. If something is not a faith, it's sin. Does God ever give us license to, to wean ourselves off of sin slowly? Never. Stop it. Jesus said, you've got a left hand that's causing you to sin. Cut it off and throw it away from you. Now, get rid of it. And look, he's serious. He said, it's better for you to go into life maimed or halt or an amputee than to be thrown into hell whole. This is serious. Jesus said, unless you forsake all that you have, you can't be my disciple. Jesus calls for total submission. That's why he says to the Jews that believed in him that unless my word abides in you, you're not really my disciple. He said, you'll prove to be my disciple if my word abides in you. That means you're doing what I've told you to do. You're, and the thing that you want to tell somebody like that is they need to stop now. You see, the problem is so often we coddle these people. It's like, well, you know, they love the Lord. And, and, but they, they've got this weakness or they're being brought into slavery. And yet the way scripture would speak is stop it, cut it off, be done with it. And I can show you everywhere where the Bible speaks that way. Stop, stop, put on Christ, put off the old man. That's how it speaks. And so we want to be careful we don't coddle people like this because what we know for a fact is that true Christians will not remain under the dominion of sin. That's Romans 6. Sin shall not have dominion over you. And what we're told is this. This is Romans 8. If by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, we will live. But if we live according to the flesh, we die. And so a person who doesn't have the moral power to overcome something they know to be wrong, that's, 
that's actually a really, it doesn't, oh, Ingrid, many people go to church and many people carry Bibles around. In fact, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I say? He said, many who call me Lord, Lord, in that day, he's going to say, I never knew you. And they're going to say, yeah, well, we did all these things. We cast out demons. We, we did these many mighty miracles and wonders. And we did all these in your name, Jesus. And he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. In other words, they were lawless. In other words, what is a law? A law is when we think that God commands something. Something pleases God. Something God's will demands of my life. And for me to knowingly fight that because I'm, I'm addicted. You see, the thing about it is we find that the cross releases power. Christ releases resurrection power so that people can walk in newness of life and become new creations in Christ. Old things are passed away. If people can't stop sinning, that's actually an indication of something that is very defective in their life. And so people like that, they need to be told, you need, you, I mean, she needs to cry out to the Lord for help and she needs to stop immediately. If she thinks it's sin, she needs to stop it. For her to continue going on, doing something she believes with all of her heart to be wrong. That condemnation she's feeling may not be from the devil. It may be from the Spirit of God who is saying just what Jesus did. You need to cut this off or there's hell waiting at the end. You say, well, wait, we're, not, we're saved by grace, by faith, not, not works. Yes, but true faith is always known by its works. Faith without works is dead. We, the scripture speaks about the obedience of faith. And, and if that obedience isn't there, then the faith is suspect. And so sin is a tremendous indicator of where people are at spiritually. Those who practice sin, scripture says very clearly, are of the devil. Those who practice righteousness, they give proof that they've been born of God. And so we ought to be able to say to any Christian at any time, that sin, stop that. That's how scripture talks. You can say, oh, wait, that, you know, that, that just sounds so simplistic. No, but that is how scripture speaks. It's like filthy, filthy speech, stop. Don't do it. It shouldn't even be named among you. It's again, we come back to we got to gouge out eyes, we've got to cut off hands. And so, if there's something, I mean, you think about gouging out an eye that's gouging out something that's pretty close to us, pretty dear to us. That's how it is with habits, that's how, how it is when we're brought under the bondage of something. We ought to be able to say no to it and say no to it in the power of the Spirit of God, and go on. That doesn't mean there may not be struggles or trips or times when we have to renew the effort. It doesn't mean that we may not face seasons of weakness, but the general pattern of our life as Christians should be that sin does not have dominion over us anymore. We're not ruled by it anymore. And so I would, the way I would speak to such a person is I wouldn't coddle them. I would warn them. And, and, and I think that that would be a very biblical approach based on a number of different passages. You, you know, it's very interesting that when the, when, think about three of the letters where sin, whether that be false doctrine or some kind of sin in the lives of the people. But Corinth probably comes closest to, to the kind of 
just sins of the flesh. Galatians and Hebrews, they deal more with doctrinal error, even though there's always practical implications. But if you think about Corinth, Paul, Paul was not dealing with, he wasn't coddling the people in their sin. His expectation was that they were going to stop doing the wrong that they were doing immediately. And, it, and of course, he commends them in the second Corinthian letter that they were so violent with their repentance. That's second Corinthians chapter seven. That's worth looking at. I mean, basically what Paul says is, you know, you vindicated yourselves by reacting so violently to the sin that I confronted you about. But somebody that, somebody that does not have the ability to overcome sin in their life, that is really an indication of a person that does not love God and is probably in real trouble. Because something's defective about the Christianity. So we just want, we want to measure everything biblically. I, I know the, you know, we have friends, we have people that we really, we, we love, we feel affection for, we're close to, and it can be hard to say strong things to them. It can be hard to say to somebody, you know, the fruit in your life is kind of indicating that you don't love God. It can be hard to say those things to people. I'm sure Paul found it extremely difficult to say the things to the Corinthians that he had to say. I know from just being a pastor and having to confront people about sin, it's not something I love to do. It's not easy. But you know, it really is the most loving thing that you can do. To have somebody examine their life in light of Scripture. And that's what Paul said, examine yourselves, test yourselves. And what we want to do is we want to find that the Christianity in our lives measures up to the Christianity that we have in Scripture. Thank you. Somebody, Thank you. You're welcome. Somebody else was going to make a comment or say something at the same oh, that, time. That was me, yeah. Okay. Um, just going back to the smoking thing, um, would you not say that it's it's wrong to to do something recreational that is so damaging to your body. It just seems irresponsible to me, but is that not simple in and of itself? Well, like I said before, where it, you know, for you to make that, for you to basically indicate to somebody that it's sin on that basis, you're saying things to them that the Bible doesn't say. And I, I would just be careful because if it comes to that which is damaging to our health, like I say, if you eat, if, if you eat certain processed food, you might be doing more damage to yourself than the guy that smokes a cigarette once a week. And I think to make that judgment about what's, I mean, you could say to somebody who skis, you know, that may not be wise. Or somebody that rides a motorcycle, you know, that's not wise. You, you know, you end up on the pavement, that's detrimental to your health. I, I think what we want to do is we, we all need to walk before the Lord. Now look, if somebody said, I knew, I knew these pastors from Arbka. They were in the Spurgeon Society. They'd get together and smoke their pipes and drink their wine. I'm not going to tell them it's wrong. Now, did they have a pipe hanging out of their mouth all the time? They might have just, who knows how much they smoked it. I don't know. If, if somebody asked me my opinion, I would tell them it's dirty, it's, it's cancer-causing, it's, 
probably not beneficial for your health. It probably isn't going to make your wife real happy. It's, it's probably not the greatest testimony. But you know, if the guy says, I, what I want people to be able to do is live their life to the glory of the Lord. Mm-hmm. And, and like I can tell you, I have certain convictions about taking money from the government. Certain handouts from the government. I have certain convictions about that. But you know what? My brother-in-law never had convictions about those things. And yet, I would watch him. He would praise the Lord when God would help him through the government. In certain ways where I felt like it would not be faith for me to take that. For him, it's just the opposite. And you know what? I recognize that Romans 14 comes into play. Brother, I can look back at Spurgeon smoking that stogie wherever he was and doing it to the glory of the Lord. And that's what I want. That's what I want from everybody here. I want that. And what I don't want is like you, Sam, with your strong convictions about why you shouldn't. And with convictions like that, you definitely shouldn't. But what I would never want you to do is condemn the guy who maybe perhaps, you don't even know. Maybe it's he smokes his pipe once a month and he really enjoys it. And it's, it's kind of like the guy that, you know, you get people are like, <clears throat> like, you know, they don't think you should drink. But here's the guy that he, he can have that glass of wine and he can praise the Lord for it. You know, some people might feel like, some people may feel convicted about eating lemon meringue pie or apple pie. It's like, ah, it's fattening and their conscience bothers them and that maybe they're overweight and they feel like they shouldn't do it. And then there's, you know, there's a guy that can just take the bite and they can hold it. They're just so grateful to God that they can have that piece of, of pumpkin pie and uh, brethren. What we just want to, we want to embrace the spirit of Romans 14, where if a guy can do it unto the Lord, let's let him do it. And let's not be other people's consciences. Yes, it's one thing. If somebody's being a drunk, if somebody's being a glutton, if somebody's being a thief or, or greedy or covetous or sexually immoral, or yes, we know there are certain things that are distinctly wrong. But in the area of liberties, we want to we, we wanna be mindful of our testimony. We want to be mindful of others. We, we want to think about how all of our actions impact other people. But at the end of the day, we re- realize that, you know what? Our brothers and sisters, they, they have a master, and it's not us. And they have to stand or fall before him. And if they can do certain things in their life, and they can do it to the glory of God, more power to them. And brethren, when we have a church full of people that are minded that way, I mean, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Having people who can rejoice and and be able to enjoy certain things that God has provided. You see, that's the spirit of 1 Timothy, is God made all these things to be enjoyed and to be received with thanksgiving. And you know what? You may find that I don't do certain things and I don't eat certain things and I don't drink certain things, but if you do and you can do it under the Lord, great. You may find I don't smoke. Um, you know, I would hope no, none of us smoke at GFM. I mean, because, because the very fact that I've come to recognize through what Sonny said that it's basically not seen as a Christian thing here. I think that's probably sufficient reason for us to seriously think. But, but you know, could somebody do it back in their garden where nobody sees and they can do it under the Lord? Hey, if you can do it by faith and you can do it under the Lord, you, you have to recognize we have us a God who created 
joy and who created things to be enjoyed. Our God is not a killjoy. He really did design things. And we, we don't want to be brought under the control of things. That's true. We need to be mindful of that. We don't want to be controlled by food. We don't want to be controlled by alcohol or nicotine or drugs or whatever it is. We don't want to be controlled by things. But brethren, we, we really have been, we, do, we need to recognize our place as a redeemed people before the Lord. That yes, there's a place to fast, there's a place to deny ourselves. There's, there's, a, there's a place to know how to be abased and to abound. And when we're abased, we need to be able to be content and joyful. And when we're allowed to abound, um, you know, even the rich, the rich the rich are told that they've been given things to enjoy, but they also need to be mindful of, of people's needs. And so we just need to keep the, the right spirit. The right spirit is that we're going to love others. And out of love, we're going to think about how the things we do and choose to do affect other people. How they affect our witness, how they affect our family. But we also do want to enjoy what God has given to us. And uh, I mean, if you come by my house, you know what you're going to see? I've got two gardenias right here. I've got an orchid right here. And I've got aloe vera right there. And you say, are those necessary? No, those are not necessary. Yep, you want to see this? You, that, that is a gardenia flower. You ever smell the gardenia flower? Rachel, have you? Can't hear you. I can't read lips either. But Tim, pop your light on a sec. You're getting a okay. bit dark, thanks. Okay. Anyway, I mean, I, I put those things there simply because I enjoy seeing what God has created. You may think this is just bizarre. I have Spotify. And you know, one of the things that I often listen to are birds singing. <laughs> You may think that that's crazy, but <laughs> God designed birds to sing, and it is so, it is so beautiful. You want to hear it? That's bizarre, brother. Yeah, defo. Yeah, you're a bit weird now. You're a bit oh, weird. That's, that's uh, Keith Green, actually, right there. But You like Keith Green? Love Keith Green. Listen to that. Isn't that amazing? Oh, it's hard by eating it down a bit. It's squeaking through my speaker. Anyway. Anything else on that before we it's already eight twelve. Carlos, what do you got to say about that? You're very intently looking. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. I would agree. There's a there's a limit. You don't want to you want to be too shallow, but you don't want to be too extreme as well. You want to be just right. You want to make sure that your consciousness is right, whatever you're doing. Of course, there are things that are exactly a no no, but yeah. Right. We have to ask questions. That's the thing. We, we need to be asking questions. I was, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I was watching um, a couple of months ago, I was watching a documentary on Netflix. They were like uh, selling um, cakes, small cakes in a store, I think in um, is it Holland or Deutschland. And they were selling the cakes, the cannabis cakes. And I was like, where does that fall into? Because, you know, it's a drug and it, it, it's kind of, it's illegal in some countries, it's not legal in some countries, but we just like, would it be normal would that fall into the same situation as nicotine? Because, you know, and then we can have also the other more intense and extreme drugs um, like cocaine, for example. Well, I think that, 
I think that coming back to alcohol is probably a good marker for thinking about these things. God allows us the liberty, clearly Jesus, he turned water into wine at a wedding. Not so that everybody could get drunk out of their minds, but clearly so that people could rejoice at a wedding. There's a difference between drinking socially to rejoice and getting drunk. And see, I think the thing that we have to think about when it comes to drugs, like, like I suffer from, from migraine headaches. If I have a heavy duty uh, medication for addressing those migraines, some kind of prescription drug, Typically, I'll take it, even though I know those heavy-duty drugs like that are probably damaging to my body. Why would I take it? Well, because a migraine will put me out of action for a whole day or maybe two, and I don't want to waste the time. And so if I've got that drug available, I'll take it. And, and see, the decision is being made to try to maximize my efficiency. I think we need to think about, you know, if like marijuana, people don't smoke marijuana in the same way that they drink alcohol. See, if you drink alcohol and you have one drink, you have one glass, okay, maybe that's one or two glasses is maybe what they did at that wedding when Jesus turned that into wine. But, you know, people don't smoke marijuana to to get the effect of one glass of wine when you smoke marijuana you smoke it to get high and what god doesn't want clearly in forbidding drunkenness he doesn't want us doing things to our to our minds where we can't think he doesn't want us dulling our senses to the point where we're oblivious. He doesn't want that. In fact, that's sin. That's clear. Drunkenness is sin. And if you think about what happens when a person gets drunk, they're, they're losing, they're, they're stepping out of touch with reality. It's idolatry. I mean, what they're doing is, okay, life is difficult. They've got problems and they try to drown their sorrows. They try, they go to the bottle or they go to the drug to try to dull their senses, to dull their problems, dull their hurts. They've, they've got, you know, we've all got problems in life. But what God wants us doing is not drowning them in drunkenness. He wants us to get drunk on the spirit. He wants us to get drunk on the love of his son. He wants us to, he wants us to drink that. That's what he wants. And so, Alcohol becomes a cheap substitute when we, when we get drunk. And so I think that's the thing we have to ask if we're going to use drugs. See, if I use a drug that overcomes my migraine and it helps me think clearly so I can function, that's, that's entirely different than taking something that dulls my senses, makes me stupid. The kind of drugs that make people stupid and, and drowsy and brain dead, I mean, that's clearly not what we want to be doing as Christians. We want our minds sharp. We want our minds taken up with truth. We, we, need, to, we need to try to maximize our time. We need, we need to redeem the time is what scripture says. You're not redeeming the time if you're, if you're inhaling drugs or eating drugs that are that are causing you to lose your mind, not be able to think straight, not be able to, I mean, here's the thing, drugs, drugs, we call a place where you go get drugs, a pharmacy. The pharmacia word group in scripture has to do with sorcery. Why would sorcery and magic 
and demonic things be connected with drugs? Well, because here's the thing. The devil is into deception. Are people more easily deceived when their mind is straight and sharp or when they're stupid and dull and dead, deadheads? I mean, there's a reason why drug abuse and demonic activity, drug abuse and, and uh, you know, the occult and that kind of thing, witchcraft, why those things go together. Because, because people lose, truth is what we're after. But you know, somebody is far more easily led into deception and lies when they're not thinking straight. And so drugs are the devil's playground. That's, that's just a matter of fact. I mean, typically as a pastor, when people have demonic issues, Look at their life. You, you can typically find a handful of things that are realities in their life. They're involved in the occult somehow. They're involved in really wicked music. They're involved in drugs. I mean, there's just certain things that open the door to demonic activity. And drugs is one of them. But, and it's, it's not just any drug. It's not the kind of drugs that that, you know, help you to stay functional or dull the, uh, I guess the kind that, the kind of medicines that we would take that we just need to be careful. I'll just say this, because even some drugs, there's many drugs that are not illegal, that are prescribed by doctors that are just as much an open door to the demonic as stuff that you buy off the streets. And so you need to be careful, especially the stuff that psychiatrists and psychologists tend to prescribe to people. It's amazing. You look at the antidepressants on the market. It's like every single one of them. One of the side effects is you become suicidal. Seriously? Uh, I mean, it's, you're giving me a drug that's supposed to help me with my depression, but the side effect is that I'm going to become suicidal. I mean, <laughs> you go figure. But that's, so you need to be careful. Even medications that help with physical maladies, got to be careful. I mean, there, there's been things that, that I just recognized, you know what, I don't, I don't want to take that anymore because I, I, don't, I don't like the way that makes me feel, or I, I just, there's something about when I take that, it's, we, we need to be really careful. Thank you. Well, probably too late to die. Anybody have any, anything else they wanna say on that or any other questions pertaining specifically to that? How would you um, deal with someone who is on antidepressants and sleeping tablets and things like that? Um, when they say they really need it, they can't, you know, go down on it. And how would you deal with that? Personally, um, I am suspicious, I am suspect, and generally negative about those things. And typically, I am going to encourage people to try to live their life without taking those things. That's what I'm going to encourage people to do. Now, listen, it's, I, I, I don't want to be overly rigid. If, I, I, know, I know two pastors 
that I've had discussions with who really suffered from depression, who found two men that I, I love and respect, pastors who they really had de- uh, severe bouts of depression. They, they, I don't think, that, I, don't even, I don't even have any idea whether they're both on the same drug or not, but, um, but they both found that doctor prescribed antidepressants helped them. And in fact, I think in both cases, the men felt like they became functional and it helped them significantly. And they take those drugs all the time. Now, look, if I was in their place, if, if I'm in the place where I can find a drug that actually helps me to function normally, it's not clouding my mind, it's actually helping me to function normally. Yes, I'm, I, look, I want to maximize this life. And if these guys in their own estimate, this is, this is the kind of Romans 14 thing where I'm not going to step in and say, no, it's not. No, it's not really helping you. No, that's not what you need to be taking. I, I'm not going to do that. If they believe through all their research and all their testing and experimenting with things that, hey, they found a drug that when they take they're able to function relatively normal and they don't find that there's significant side effects. What am I going to say to them? I I am not going to tell them that that's wrong. I think what they're trying to do is redeem the time. They're trying to make life as, as fruitful as possible. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to condemn them for that. Um, Typically though, Typically, when I have found people in churches that take like sleeping pills or take antidepressants, that's not the case. I'm actually not finding people who most of the time are taking these things and it's making their life really fruitful and their walk with God is really healthy and it's, and it's good and they're you know, they're growing and they're maturing and they're walking with Christ and their minds are clear and they're, they're absorbing scripture. That's typically not the case. Typically, it's the opposite. Typically, in those cases, it's a lot of times, it's people who are still doing the same things and taking the same things that they took when they were lost and then they made a profession, and now they're still taking these things. Um, in most of those cases, I am going to encourage the people not to take them. Now, I know for pastors to do that, there's a risk. Do any of you know that John MacArthur and his church, was in, they were wrapped up in a lawsuit for almost the entire decade of the 80s? Anybody aware of that? They, some, somebody on their pastoral staff, somebody at the church there recommended to a young man who is taking antidepressants. They encouraged him to come off those antidepressants. He did, and he committed suicide. And the parents sued Grace Community Church. Now, in the end, they won the court battle. But of course, being tied up in court for 10 years was a massive trial. And so I recognize pastors are in a dangerous place because their pastors are trying to give spiritual counsel, but drugs have a place in a person's spiritual well-being. I know we're not doctors, but sometimes you just, you get a definite sense of there being spiritual realities that take place with regards to drugs. And so, um, look, what I'm confident of is this. We have us a God who is able 
to heal what ails us. We have a God who sent his son into the world and healed people of demons and physical problems. And we're still told that, you know, there's a, there's a place to be seeking God for miraculous healing. But, it, but even beyond that, I am, I am absolutely convinced that we have a God who sets people in their right mind. You remember how it was with the demoniac. We have a God who's in the business of putting people in their right minds. And I think, I think so often we, we, we run to doctors too quick. I mean, there's a place for doctors. There's a place for the medical community. But I'm just afraid that maybe we, we run to the medical help before we run to God, before we ask the Lord to help and to heal us. I knew a pastor, speaking of pastors who take drugs, um, I knew a pastor who was given, to, I believe, to grand mal seizures. And he took seizure medication to keep those from happening. But there were side effects, and I think drowsiness was one of them. And, or they tend to, you know, drowsiness tends to be a negative side effect with a lot of things. But one day he told me he was in his bathroom, he was looking at himself in the mirror, and he just said, That's it. He took those, and he, he cried out to the Lord, and he took all of his anti seizure medication, flushed it down the toilet, and he never had a seizure again. And now he's 70 years old, and it's been decades, and he's never had a seizure since. Brethren, there is a place to trust the Lord. The Lord can heal us. The Lord can help us. The Lord can set us straight. A lot of problems people try to medicate are demonic problems. They're spiritual problems. People are trying to medicate spiritual and demonic problems, sin problems, and demonic problems all the time. They're trying, to, they're trying to address these things with drugs, and it never helped. We have to address people at the root cause of their problem. And that's, that's, it, it, can be, it can be difficult to try to sort these things out. But you know what? Even if we're confused, our God is not confused. He knows what's going on. We just, we need to trust him. And it may be that in faith, we end up like these two pastors' examples I gave you, that in faith, we end up taking something prescribed by a doctor. But it may be the opposite as well. Again, it's a place where we don't want to have a checklist. We, we need to be able to walk before the Lord and run all these things through the filter of Scripture, 